He's got one foot in the frying pan and one in the pressure cooker. Believe me, as a bowler, I know that right about now, your bladder feels like an overstuffed vacuum cleaner bag, and your butt is kind of like an about-to-explode bratwurst. Hey, do you mind? I wasn't talking when you were bowling. Was I talking out loud? Welcome to Munson's at the Movies. My name is Kyle. I will once again be your host. I'm joined by the rest of the Munson's. I'm going to give them a wide berth. He's what is called a born loser. A real Munson. <laughs> Talk a little bit about what's going on in the world. Warren. Last time I made a bold sports prediction that actually didn't make Final Cut, and I'm glad it didn't. <laughs> but whenever this gets released, I'm happy to say that the Astros are five games within first place. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, James, how about the Yankees? Where are they going to be? I don't know. I just want to do better than Warren, pretty much. Whatever. I just, I just want them to beat the Astros. When this actually comes out, I'll be uh, a few days away from getting married for the third time. First official one. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. We are the classic COVID wedding where it was supposed to happen last April, and we moved it back supposed to happen this april and then we uh, had to completely change things up and make it as small as humanly possible because covid's still around full year guys this is awful but me and the wife you will be getting uh, married in a few days here congrats buddy finally yeah dude. congrats rigby uh nothing much on my end pumped to talk some philip seymour hoffman he's been one of my favorite actors um and yeah it's a good time for sports, Final Four, baseball starting, things are revving up, and the weather's getting warmer, so life is good. All is good. Case? I know this is kind of on the spot and would be considered public workshopping, but I wanted you all's opinion on something. I'm thinking of starting a podcast in conjunction with Munson's at the Movies called How in the Hell Are They Related? <laughs> and we're going to launch it with a two-part episode looking at the son of Rita Wilson and Tom Hanks. <laughs> as well as the brother of Colin Hayes. No, t- <laughs> as you guys know, I'm talking about Chet Hayes. H A Z E. <laughs> Anybody interested? Anybody interested in this podcast with me? <laughs> yeah, I mean, is it going to be on your OnlyFans account, Craig? <laughs> I'm veering away from that. I'm, I'm trying to stay in the podcasting world. <laughs> on my side, speaking of podcasts, I watched the first episode of the Mighty Ducks Game Changer series on Disney Plus. Mm. And the funniest joke in the first episode is when they're recruiting the kid next door and he says, I would not be an asset physically. I have more of a podcast spot. <laughs> oh man. Relatable. Found, found to be ex- <laughs> to be extraordinarily funny. But not bad. I crushed all the Mighty Ducks movies and I have determined that D three Mighty Ducks is the best of the three. I will not be taking any comments at this time. And we will move on with life to talk about our returning guest, Mike Rodmaker. Welcome back, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me, Monsons. Appreciate you. Yeah, man. Uh, Mike is born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. He moved to Los Angeles in 2016 to pursue a career in photography and film. His work in those fields is focused on the outdoors, sports, and documentary filmmaking. He's an avid runner, climber, movie nerd, and popcorn enthusiast. And he was here for us to discuss Mahershala Ali back on episode 13, which we talked about was like seven months ago. And it feels like yesterday. And that just tells you how fast time is going. So welcome back, Mike. You picked a good one as we sit here and get ready for a conversation of Philip Seymour Hoffman. Thanks. Hey, you guys are really throwing me some softballs with the uh, episodes I'm on here. I mean, lots of love about both of those actors. I think Warren's really happy that you uh, chose the actors that you did. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no shit, man. Not the the biggest Christopher Fairbank fan is what I'm sensing over there. So good thing we avoided that pothole. But it's good to have you back. We had a lot of fun last time. And this is going to be one of our highest scoring months since I have a feeling. Yeah. Can't wait. We'll see. Uh, we'll see. We will see. <laughs> Birthdays, April 8th. Warren laid on us. First off, we got Robin Wright. Princess Bride, Forrest Gump, Wonder Woman. Blade Runner 2049 and Justice League. <laughs> Not the Snyder Cut, the first Justice League. How old is Robin Wright? 61, Warren. What? <laughs> <laughs> if she's 61, she's a hot 61. Give me 58. 54. Damn it. I'll go 55. I'm going to go low, 52. All right, Craig on the dot, 55. 
Damn. Ooh. Nice. Good thing James took a guess. <laughs> <laughs> Second up, we got Taylor Kitsch, Lone Survivor, Snakes on a Plane, Friday Night Lights, and Battleship slash John Carter. How old is Riggs? He looks like those actors that would play high schoolers, even though they were like already in their mid twenties. Yeah. I'm thinking he's like 35, 39. Warren. I'm going to take a uh, 41, 37. Give me 40. Craig sneaking in back door. 40 on the dot. Wow. Jesus. Two for two. Nice. The guy was doing research before showing up. <laughs> That's why he's running a little late. Maybe. Last but not least, we got Patricia Arquette. True romance, boyhood, holes, and little Nikki slash tiptoes. <laughs> How old is Patricia Arquette? Popeye's chicken is fucking awesome. 61. <laughs> 55, Warren. Big 6 0. 58. 57. 53. Ooh. She's oh, younger. Man. Everybody busted. So one dollar, one dollar Bob would have won. <laughs> yeah, those are the birthdays for today. All right, so five actors that were tossed on the wheel: Samantha Morton, Michael Clark Duncan, Jack Black, Christopher Fairbank, and Phil Hoffman, aka Philip Seymour Hoffman. And as you know by now, the wheel has struck gold on Philip Seymour Hoffman, a guy who is an acting legend. He has about 65 total credits, mostly film, a couple shorts in there. He's done some producing, and as we'll talk about, he's done a lot on the theater side as well from a directing standpoint. So while he is no longer with us, rest in peace, and we will talk about what led to that. The man did a lot during his career. So before we talk about that, we'll get into some trivia. And James, let's see what he's got for us. Give a refresher. We are going to do two truths and a lie. And the lie is going to actually be about a cast member of the Fast and the Furious franchise. I have about a thousand cast members, so it gives me a lot of options. <laughs> um, and you guys have to guess which one is not, in fact, about uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. So the first fact is that he initially began his acting career because he had a crush on a girl in the high school drama club and wanted to follow her. Fact number two, he's a devout New York Jets and Knicks fan. Fact number three, he was only a Grammy Award win away from being the 17th person to win an EGOT, which is the Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony Awards. I'm going to go the first one is a lie, and I think that's Paul Walker. Have one of you guys actually guessed the correct actor from fast and the furious before <laughs> probably not i think craig did it once i feel like if, if that happens we should celebrate it was the wrong fact but he got the right actor and going off that i think the lie is number two i think that eddie marson who he starred in mission impossible three and god's pocket with i truly don't know who that actor is that fuck you is named. that craig eddie <laughs> <laughs> you guys know him you know him if you saw him He's like a weird looking short guy. Oh, yeah. He was a brother in Ray Donovan. Oh, oh, the, he's the, the boxer in Ray Donovan. Yeah. The brother. But something yeah. tells me I lost. So we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Okay, okay, go, go. I remember. I'm going to say number two is a lie, and that's actually James. <laughs> that's James. <laughs> what was James' role on The Fast and the Furious? Was he a consultant? I did have a cameo in Fast and Furious, so Warren, okay. you're on the trail. <laughs> All right. I'm going to say, I think it's two as well, and I think that was actually Roxy D'Alonzo, who was Vin Diesel's personal makeup artist in Furious 7. Oh, um, Jesus. Ooh. Huge well Knicks played. fan. Huge. I might be related to whoever you just named. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go one, and I'm going to say that was uh, The Rock who felt that way. Nice. Mm. Honestly, you might be right, to be quite honest. But fact number one is actually about Philip Seymour Hoffman. While it wasn't his uh, initial acting role, he was 14. We'll get into why he was looking to do other stuff after school in a little bit. But he got hurt. He was 14, couldn't play sports anymore, saw a girl that he thought was hot, joined the drama club. I was like, cool, I'll do that. She was actually interested in his older brother. But he won a minor role, and he said, ever since then, I've just been acting ever since. Fell in love with it. Fact number two is true. My boy, <sighs> the last picture of him at a Jets game was 2011 Jets-Giants Christmas Eve. I was also there. It was the death of the Rex Ryan error as Victor Cruz scored a 99-yard touchdown, solidifying that the Jets would never make the playoffs again. <laughs> <laughs> and he actually wore a Jets hat to the Sundance Film Festival that year. Someone asked him about it. He's like, it's sad. We had a good run. It's over. It's sad. 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 
I am so sad. <laughs> that is a direct quote. And you can hear exactly how he said that, too. Oh, my. <laughs> yes. That is a true fan where he's just like, yeah, it's never fucking happening. We're beat. Wow. We know we're beat. Is it common? No, but uh, it's actually even funnier for a different reason. Uh, fact number three is not about Philip Seymour Hoffman. He had been nominated for an Emmy, a Tony, and an Oscar, but he actually only won an Oscar. It's actually about Dame Helen Mirren, the star of <clears throat> Fate and the Furious, Hobbs and Shaw, and Fast and Furious 9. She just needs to release a record, potentially win a Grammy, and she'll be the 17th person to win an EGOT. I'm more shocked she's actually in that franchise with a recurring role. It's wild to me. Yes. She just needs to produce some music and she can get her Grammy. She doesn't need to actually rap. Mm -hmm. No way. She's got to team up with Luda. (laughs) (laughs) I'm 100% on Greg's side. I think if you're in the area that Luda is, I think you have to rap. (laughs) As well as Tyrese. I mean, Tyrese did like R&B. Like she's got to do something in that realm. I think so. It's interesting because Craig hit me up and Philip Seymour Hoffman is like one of the actors that we've covered that is actually in the least amount of movies with people from Fast and the Furious, by far the least. Uh, he's only been in five movies with other actors that have been in this franchise. And and Craig shared with me like extras, like he has specifically <laughs> avoided anyone who's in this realm. <laughs> That tells me that uh, Paul Thomas Anderson does not cast anyone from the Fast and Furious franchise. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Pretty much. James, that's the first time in a long time none of us have gotten it right. I know, Usually, dude. I'm pretty pumped about that. I think it's been a few months. Yeah, that was a good job, James. Yeah, fuck you, James. <laughs> <laughs> that's love, baby. It's all love. Well, speaking of love, Case, uh, tell us about what you, it has nothing to do with love. But I love when you tell us about their snapshot in box office history. And I'm interested to hear what you have on the Phil Hoffman side. Way to pull that one off. You know, it shouldn't be any surprise to anybody that Hoffman is going to be very high on our box office and uh, popularity list. He's really done it all. When you're looking at it, he's got some, you know, independent films with small budget like Love Liza and God's Pocket, which were each around a million. And then he's had some huge box office projects like Mission Impossible Three, and then the Two Hunger Games, which were both over 150 million. He also puts up really high critic and fan rankings compared to other performers, ranking second and third, respectively. And he is only the second actor to average higher than 70% in both critic and fan rankings. Anybody have a guess? The other one? Was it Emma? It is Emma Thompson. Yeah. Very good. Mm. That makes sense. He's only got a handful of movies that lost money, so that's that's pretty impressive. But... The biggest return that he has on any movie that he was in is Capote, which grossed $49 million against the $7 million budget. Mm. And some of the other actors we have, I mean, they're, they're four to five times that. And so he gets he drops down a little bit on our rankings and those very small areas. But overall, it's it's really good. Final note I have is when you look up somebody's IMDb star ranking, it's got their bar. And then on the right of the screen, it's got who other people look for. And he has probably the coolest five. Paul Thomas Anderson, Juliana Moore, Jennifer Lawrence, Amy Adams and Edward Norton. Yeah, it's pretty good. Overall, you know, really good box office, good popularity, great critic and fan profile for Philip Seymour Hoffman as, as we dive into his career. So how does he rank with all the metrics comparatively to the other 32? He ranks 18th in star meter, second in critic, third in fan, 19th in some box office rankings, and then overall he's at six. Okay. Pretty good. Thanks, Case. Yeah, man. All right, so before we talk about first feature film, we'll do the early Phil Hoffman days. As James had mentioned, he was drawn to the theater at age 12, right? Wanted to impress a girl, but also got really interested in Arthur Miller's All My Sons. Was a wrestler, a baseball player, had a little sports injury, led him to this area. When he was 16, he first made waves in the theater side, playing Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman, which was a role that the theater director didn't really want. She didn't really want to direct the play because she didn't feel comfortable putting a high school student in that role. But she met him and said, this is the person for it. And apparently blew everyone away, standing ovation from the entire crowd for him. And that's when he started to kind of put his, his face and his name out there. From there, he made his way over to NYU to study acting. This is also when his a lot of his personal trouble started. So while he was doing his thing on the acting side, my man was dabbling in a lot of alcohol and drugs. While he was in college, he pretty much said that he did anything he could get his hands on. 
back in the day. And that led him to making an appearance at a rehab in 1989, which, you know, a little bit of foreshadowing of kind of where we're going to go a couple decades later. But he does get clean. And in that process, he started to do some off-Broadway work. The one story I, I read was he played King Lear in a play, and there's a completely nude scene. And I remember there was some really seasoned theater professionals looking at this kid like, he has the balls to stand up there and be completely nude in a theater night after night. Not a lot of young actors are willing to do that. Actually looking at the balls of him. Yeah, yeah. straight yeah. up. <laughs> Still I, looking at his balls. I wow, physically don't the balls. have the balls to stand yeah. up there, and that is why I wouldn't. Yeah, it, it, it was either him or Jason Siegel. It was one of the two. <laughs> they were going to do it over and over and over. But while he was doing that, so he's, he's working off-Broadway. He's doing some customer service jobs. And his first acting role, professional acting role, was on an episode of One Life to Live. So he started in the soaps, boys, as a stage manager in 1989. A couple of years later, he's in an episode of Law & Order, 91. Which is like... Every New York based actor's first yes. role. Because, yep. like, there's only like so many shows that are filmed in New York, and Law and Order's been there for like 30 years. So, every actor from New York is. Seriously. Like, and their first role where they were a rapist or they were raped on TV is uh, here in Law and Order SVU. When well, you're filling another plot line, right? You, yeah, all right, exactly. who's another local actor we can pull in that no one knows who he is? All right, you're in. Let's go, Phil. And he was accused of rape in this episode, I believe, right? Yeah, dude. Have you seen Law & Order? Like, I bet he was accused of rape in that one. And then the next episode was about rape. And the one after that was probably rape. <laughs> it's always the same. Still going to this day. So <laughs> yeah. the model seems to work. Yes. 92, he's in a movie called the My New Gun. I don't know if anybody else watched it. I know, James, you said Cool World is like one of the worst movies you've ever seen. This movie... Phil Hoffman is in like two scenes, very short appearance, but I think it is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Did you see Cool World? I did. And? I, I mean, I hate Cool World too. Like I can, I can equally hate both of them. But which one is worse? Make a decision right now because I haven't seen this one. And so I'm going to trust your opinion here. There is some entertainment value to Cool World because it's bad shit. Whereas My New Gun is... Diane Lane plays possibly the most naive character in movie history, trusting the kid next door that she doesn't know, answering his phone call at 3 a.m. and not recognizing that he's literally like in the most deep shit of all time. Let's him borrow her car. Like, dude, that's the early 90s where everyone trusted their neighbors. And God, it was, you know, it was just normal back then, man. Yeah, I don't know about that. But <laughs> his role is pretty minor in that he plays a guy who gets shot in a ridiculous plot point uh, and works at a fast food restaurant. I forgot to make a comment on the movie that came out before this. He has a really small role called Triple Bogey on a Par 5 Hole. He's got a, a super tiny role in it. He's got a really weird name, but he's got one line or he's got like one little scene. Oh, it's Clutch with a K. How douchey is that? <laughs> he's like he's like a biker in a pool bar, <laughs> and he has a conversation with the main character. I think it was on YouTube. Clutch. I don't think I paid all that much attention to it, but you can just see it is a fresh out of college Phil, and he is just like tiny, and his it, like his voice just kind of carries the whole thing. But his little bit in the movie was enough to kind of drag you know make you focus on him. Mm -hmm. The short hair days for Phil Hoffman. Yeah. At this point in time, before he gets all shaggy several years later and kind of defines his career. When he's just credited as Phil Hoffman at this point. Exactly. Yeah. Until he starts being in other movies. Until he starts becoming Seymour. And that takes us to his first feature film in 92. And that is his role in Scent of a Woman. Hoo -ah! And Rigby is going to talk about it. So everyone probably knows this movie for that, or for what Kyle just said, the hoo -ah. Yep. Al Pacino's oscar-winning role in this movie it's about a guy named charlie who's played by chris o'donnell he's a prep school student he's really broke and he wants to find a way to pay for his trip home for christmas and he applies for a job to watch over a retired military serviceman played by al pacino who's cranky he's blind he's really ornery he just doesn't uh get along well with people the movie is about their relationship over the course of thanksgiving weekend which they spend together in new york city Philip Seymour Hoffman in this movie plays uh, George, who's uh, a prep school student with Charlie, um, kind of a troublemaker, sort of a wise ass, um, smart aleck. Uh, I would say he's probably like the villain of the movie because 
the moral conundrum of the movie is that Charlie and George see their friends pulling this hoax on the dean of the school. And they're basically – the dean says, um, you need to tell me who did this to Charlie and George or else I'll expel you. And so they have this weight hanging over them for the whole movie on whether or not they're going to rat out their friends. At the end of the movie, Philip Seymour Hoffman's character does rat out the friends but kind of puts the pressure on – Chris O'Donnell's character to really uh, be the bad guy. So I would say if there is like a villain of the movie, even though like it's not really that kind of movie, but if there's a character that you kind of walk away from the movie hating the most, it's probably Philip Seymour Hoffman's. But that being said, I think Philip Seymour Hoffman is he's funny in it because he's they, they needed someone who was like a privileged sort of pompous asshole type character. And he does it really well. Mm hmm. The movie drags a lot. Mm -hmm. Pacino is good, and he uh, he probably deserved the Oscar um, for this, but I wouldn't recommend it to anybody that hasn't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this is kind of – they gave him the Oscar because he hadn't won before, and I think this was one yeah. of those like, let's just give it to him after all these years, um, but definitely not top five for me for his, for his filmography, I would say. Mm -hmm. That happens a lot too where it's like, this isn't the performance you should have won it for, but we kind of screwed up last time, so we're going to give it to you for this one. Right. Like Laura Dern. Mm. Yep. There are some very touching moments in it. The scene where he walks in and, and Pacino's uh, character's trying to commit suicide and he talks him out of it. That was a good one. Yeah, it's just too long, man. It just drags. And I got kind of sick of Chris O'Donnell's character. I really did. This is a podcast about Philip Seymour Hoffman, and I would say that uh, he did a great job in this for his, you know, one of his first big roles. If the goal of this movie is for you to for him to be the antagonist, he does it pretty well. It's basically the same character that he was playing in that Law and Order episode, where he's just this like privileged mm -hmm. Ivy League mm -hmm. kid, and he plays the same thing upcoming in the you know, yeah. talented Mr. Ripley and yep. like a couple yep. other movies between now and then. The person who should have won Best Actor this year should have been Joe Pesci in My Cousin. Vinny. My Cousin Vinny. Oh, so good. I'd probably agree with that. This was your Emma Thompson one for Howard's End. Mm -hmm. I read that Phil Hoffman auditioned like five times for this role. So it was not an easy one for him to get either. They, vet, they vetted him pretty hard before they finally hired him to do it. Oh, really? He considers this like his big breakthrough. He said he was still like folding clothes at laundromats and stuff. And, and then once he had this role, he's, he said, I, I never had a job that wasn't a paid acting gig after that. He's like, this was my big breakthrough. It was, and it did do really well at the box office. I think it, it was like $130 million over a $30 million budget or something. But it was pretty successful, so it definitely opened it up to a lot of, a lot of eyeballs. Uh, for your first movie, I would say that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. First big one. All right, so coming out of 92 over the next uh, – we've got five years until our next category. Um you know, he, he's pretty busy in the next couple of years coming up off the scent of a woman, but we're not going to talk about most of them because there's a lot of heavy hitters that we want to make sure we carve out time for. But he did six movies between 93 and 95. 95, he joined the Broadway Labyrinth Theater Company. He later became the co-artistic director. And during that time, as the, the artistic director, he directed 19 plays. So very, very busy on the theater side outside of his film work. In 96, he makes his... Paul Thomas Anderson debut in PTA's first movie, Hard Eight, as a young craps player. One scene. I thought he was awesome in his very, very small scene. But it's incredible watching this movie, knowing that it came out in 96, when the the film work and everything, like, you could have told me this came out in 2015, and they mm -hmm. just, like, de-aged everybody, and I'd believe you. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he improvised everything in that scene. He's incredible in that scene, man. Yeah. Cigarette in his mouth, just going at it, just going yeah. after him. Fucking old timer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Followed that up in '96. Um, a good year. He's in Twister as Dustin. He kills the like stoner scientist role so well that I remember seeing yeah. him in this role, and then when I saw him in later movies, I was like. That's the dude from Twister? <laughs> exactly. and, you know, like, and he's like this super dramatic actor. I was like, isn't that like the stoner dude? <laughs> I will always remember him just going, food, food, food. <laughs> and he, he dis when he's discussing tornadoes, he calls the middle of it the suck zone. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's the suck zone you don't want to go anywhere near that i always get very weird responses when when i'll be talking about actors with people and they bring up philip seymour hoffman i'll be like oh 
he was great in Twister. <laughs> I mean, it's like the last movie anybody ever thinks about. It's the first one I think about for him. <laughs> and it holds up, man. I watched it the other day. It's still good. It's corny, but yeah. it, it's good. Twister's fucking awesome, man. Follows it up in 97 with probably one of his, again, one of the, the roles that a lot of people talk about. And that's his role as Scotty and Boogie Nights as the uh, eerily sexual mm-hmm. all over Dirk Diggler character. I'm a fucking idiot. I'm a fucking idiot. I'm a fucking idiot. I'm a fucking idiot. First of all, I love Boogie Nights, but that that scene always just God, it's like so cringeworthy. It's you just can't watch it and not just get like make your stomach hurt. like your stomach doesn't hurt after it because he's first of all he's so socially awkward to begin with. That's like kind of when because that's it's the night of like when Dirk Diggler's like life's kind of like going down the shitter. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it's just it's a it's a hard scene to watch. You like you like don't know where it's going, and then he just goes for it, tries to make out with him, and it twice fires twice, yeah, <laughs> and it uh it backfires tremendously on him. He's also in the funniest, in my opinion, the funniest scene, and it's when Diggler whips it out for the first time on set. And you see everybody's reaction, like the camera guy peeks his head around the side of the camera <laughs> and it shows like everybody's sitting there on set and he's holding the the, uh, boom, the mic, mic boom mic. and he's like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> like he's trying to keep from like blowing a load in his pants while he's sitting there looking at them. <laughs> But it is so funny, like his his reaction. Everyone else is like eyebrows like go up, and he's like, they're like nice, and he's like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> blended acting. Poor sound operators out there, <laughs> <laughs> especially on the porn set. I can't imagine it's terribly comfortable. But dude, Alf- Alfred Molina. I know we talked about yes, this, and yes. his his role like seven minutes long in the movie. I think I watched Creepy. that like three times. Mm-hmm. He is just an absolute blast to watch in this movie. I agree, Warren, wholeheartedly. The next year, another one of his memorable roles, he plays Brant in The Big Lebowski. The dude abides. He's in my favorite scene where he's sitting there showing him around. And is it Bunny Lebowski <laughs> sees the dude and is like, I'll suck your cock for $1,000. <laughs> <And then, laughs> Tara Reed. Tara Reed, that's right. And Philip Seymour Hoffman's laugh afterwards is the funniest <laughs> shit ever. <laughs> like, ah, 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 ah. We love her. <laughs> like, trust. Like, she jokes around, and the dude's like, I'm going to go to an ATM and I'll, I'll be back. <laughs> like, you stay there. He's so good and just like a nerd in that movie. At this point in his career, like, the range is so impressive already, where you're like, mm-hmm. no fucking way this is the same guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Boogie Nights is PTA, right? So that would have been his second PTA movie at that point mm-hmm. in time in his career. Yep. And there's more to come. Speaking of 98, he's in Shopping and Fucking, a stage production where he plays an ex heroin addict. So, kind of a little bit of a meta role for him. I thought that name was particularly interesting. I think he's like 10 years clean at this point. Yeah, I think like 80, that, yeah, 89. So, yeah, nine yep. years later. He said that if he was a rich kid in college, he probably wouldn't have survived. Like, if he had the ability to get his hands on even more drugs, Dude, he probably wouldn't have survived his, college. His situation is a situation that is playing out now. I think it was just ahead of its time where he had a substance abuse issue, you know, around alcohol and experimenting with drugs in college when most people have those issues go unchecked because everyone's binging. And what happens now is, you know, someone gets into prescription pills and then it gets too expensive, and then they get into heroin. Yep. That's kind of what happened with him. Mm-hmm. That wasn't what he was always about, but when he eventually OD'd later in life, it was that. Out of necessity, right at that point in time. Dude, it's it's all over the place. It, they, He's just like one of the first famous people we've seen be impacted by it. And then also in 98, he's in a movie called Happiness, plays a character named Alan. I saw a ton of people online talking about how unique his character is. It was, it's like a creepy, masturbating character critics loved it i don't know if anybody saw it but it seemed to be one that well uh, you sold me on it so i know that. <laughs> i mean him playing a creepy masturbating character i'm sure he took it to the nth degree so i think this is where john lovitz did his research for his role in little nicky in the uh, intro <laughs> <laughs> Largest audience gap is in 98, so 98, very busy year for him, and that's his role in Patch Adams and Mike as our guest Munson, 
is tackling this. So if you first time listener, our guests basically take my review. So whatever movie I'm supposed to review, in this case, it's largest audience gap. And it's one I think a lot of us probably watched a bunch when we were younger. Mike, have at it. I remember watching this shortly after it came out. And I it's funny because I hadn't seen it since then. And I couldn't remember anything for the life of me about the movie. I just remembered I hated it at the time, <laughs> um, which is funny. As, as a kid, like you would probably get into it. But I don't know. For one reason or another, it just was always like a kind of stuck a, a sour taste in my mouth. I have some mixed feelings on it. It's really Robin Williams' movie. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. he does it he, like he's born to play this role. Quick synopsis here. So you got Robin Williams, Patch Adams here, struggling, uh, borderline suicidal man uh, who's trying to find his purpose. He's kind of down and out here at the beginning. Checks himself into uh, like a mental hospital and ends up just really connecting with the patients figures out that's his purpose in life like he needs to bring happiness to people and that's what gets him out of bed in the morning so he goes to medical school where he uh, is roommates with our boy uh, philip seymour hoffman who plays the character mitch mitch is kind of a prick from the beginning (laughs) i think that word is used multiple times Mm -hmm. in that movie (laughs) between the two so no you know no stranger to that Mitch is a, I think he's a third generation doctor to be, takes the whole entire medical school and the profession very, very, very seriously, which is backed up by the dean and the structure of the school, which turns Patch, Robin Williams' character, off uh, very quickly, where he'll, of course, then go into trying to make people happy, try to improve the quality of life uh, while he's in medical school. And so doesn't rub well with the dean, doesn't rub well with Mitch. Um, has some trouble winning over his his girl in the movie here, Karen, who also is just like thinks he's kind of a goof and doesn't take himself seriously. He's fortunately very talented. He's very smart. He's always top of his class. So he can kind of fall back on that over time here, um, starts to kind of win over some folks. Uh, they, they see the difference he makes here. Even Mitch, PSH's character here, starts to come around slowly, uh, although it is quite slow. I remember wanting to like it because I loved Robin Williams at that time and being like, oh, it was just okay." And then I never watched it again. And then I watched it for this podcast. And I think the reason why 10 year old me didn't like it is it is very dark. And these are very adult Mm -hmm. scenes that are happening. It's just you have Robin Williams is like amazing, coked up physical energy that you're like, oh, he's so entertaining, but he's talking about suicide, he's talking about cancer, like it is heavy topics. And oh, yeah. I think my young self was just like, I thought it was okay, and I really wanted to love it. I will always remember the giant gynecology legs Dude, um, it's still opening at the door. <laughs> I, I fucking teared up. When every once in a while, Robin Williams will hit you with a joke that just floors you. <laughs> and when they turn the corner... If when all the gynecologists turn the corner and it's the legs coming off the building so that the door is in between the legs. And he's like, come on in, guys. It's warm. And then he goes, come on. And then he makes it echo as he walks in. I fucking burst out laughing. He's like, it's right inside. Side, side. <laughs> come in, cold-handed ones. <laughs> yeah, it's so fucking good. So, Rodmaker, where do you fall on the audience to critic side? Of this scale, I think I lean a little bit more on on the critic side here. I, you know, as we kind of discussed, you, you want to like a lot of this, and there's a lot to like. Don't get me wrong. I think the the gap here stems from kind of the writing and the structure of the story. It was probably someone in the adaptation from the real life Patch Adams, uh, but like the performances are great. Um, there's nothing to to dislike about Robin Williams, Philip Seymour Hoffman, or, or really anyone here. It plays really well to the strengths. I think um, it feels a little bit hokey sometimes for me. Don't get me wrong. Like it is based in disliking the healthcare system, which is Americans. We have very good reason to do. Oh yeah, dude. Very straight to the point with it too. I I was like, that probably went over my head when I was 10. Had no idea what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, it feels a little propped up, a little bit aspirational and overly romanticized about the medical practice, you know, in terms of how it relates here to, Philip Seymour Hoffman and his career, his character, I think, represents what is probably the most realistic piece of the entire production. It provides a relatable perspective to where most of us, if we encountered Patch Adams in real life, would probably fall. Yeah. Although it's nice when he he comes around a little bit, it's like, okay, we, we get it. We want some of that. We just don't want all of Patch 
atoms yeah. uh, treating us. And so I think that's where we can relate to it is through Mitch as the character. And so I think that's where you get some of the gap. It's a damn good review. Yeah, man. Damn, Rod. That was good. I appreciate that. All right. So 99 to 2004 is our next chunk as we keep chugging along here 99 he's in a movie called flawless is rusty he plays opposite robert de niro he's a super fanboy of de niro at this time huge fan of his and hoffman is flexing his range again he's playing a transgender drag queen who is at opposition with de niro's character most of the movie until they become friends and is a very unique role he's definitely put some range together for that one so 99 is a busy year He's in his third PTA movie in Magnolia as Phil, the caretaker who's just trying to help the man fulfill his final goal of finding his long lost Tom Cruise son. Yeah, this is a pretty emotional movie. And I would say the scenes with Jason Robards and Philip Seymour Hoffman are probably the most emotional of the movie. Really good acting by, by PSH in this for sure. Follows that up. 99 as well. He's in the talented Mr. Ripley as Freddie is the kind of a rich boy character as Mm -hmm. james alluded to earlier he's got a really good scene in this when he's confronting matt damon about potentially killing dickie greenleaf he's kind of messing around with the piano and deducing a bunch of stuff around this apartment in italy i read that meryl streep watched this movie and was so enamored with his acting in this and that was kind of what drove Hmm. her to end up doing doubt with him in the future oh okay yeah, he's pretty awesome in that role. It's the same, like, rich, snobby, absolute, just asshole, but I mean, he's very true to it. You know, it's interesting. At this point, you're starting to see the caliber of actors that he's associating with. And yep. the roles yeah. that he's starting to pick are also getting picked by some of these more established folks. Mm-hmm. And it's just, I mean, it'll continue throughout his career. But you, you really have a few at this point where you're like, okay, like, this is, a, this is somebody to watch. Mm-hmm. I feel like you're taking a shot at the Fast and Furious movies. <laughs> <laughs> a little backhanded. <laughs> Slightly. And we love you for it. Um, 2000 hits, Change of the Millennia. And he plays a, a pretty fascinating character, Lester Bangs in Almost Famous, which I rewatched. Still love it as much as the first time I saw it. And what I love about his character, you could turn that type of like rock critic into a caricature of sorts. And it, he just yeah. he does it good justice in like kind of a mentor role for the young character of the movie. I like it. Yeah, I would agree 100 percent, Kyle. I haven't seen it in, in several years. Does the sing along scene still hold up? Oh, yeah. All right. The air a lot of people make when they're when they're playing this kind of character is they go over the top with their ranting. Mm-hmm. You really felt like this is a genuine critic and not somebody that was just over the top about everything. These are typically the roles in movies where you're like, you don't know who it is. It's a totally replaceable role. And this was one that you couldn't just replace with anybody. No, like he was, he was so good as, as Lester that he just brings this like gravitas to it. And Mm -hmm. uh, some, some humor and knowledge and like the look, the look works really well too. Yeah. At this point, he's like a certified scene stealer in every movie that he's in, where it's like, yeah, he's not in for that much, but yes. man, he's great in that one scene. Though. Yeah, we're really not skipping any movies at this point in his career. Like early yeah. on, we did, yep. but right now, this is literally like chronologically, he's just mm-hmm. one home run after another. Yep. Even if it's all supporting roles, he's doing fantastic work. We're going back to the theater side, in 2000, he plays opposite John C. Riley, who he was in Boogie Nights with in a stage production of True West, which is one of my favorite plays. And uh, he got a Tony nomination for that. So getting some love on the theater side. He also got two Drama Desk Award nominations for Outstanding Directing of a Play for Jesus Hop the A-Train in 01 and Our Lady of 121st Street in 03. So not only is he doing great work on stage, he's also getting recognized for his work off stage. That takes us to 2002, which is pretty much his first legit leading role in a movie. And that's his role as Wilson in Love, Liza. A movie where his wife kills herself. Spoiler. <laughs> 20 years later, deal with it. But but him just trying to like manage and figure out how to maintain after that. The way you described it is a lot of his roles where he's playing some sort of dramatic situation and you're super uncomfortable. And you're right there with him. Yeah. And it, even if it's a situation you can't imagine yourself, you're just like, oh, I don't want to watch this anymore. It was a tough one. For sure. He lives out this character of just full depression mode, and it's just hard to watch from that standpoint. Mm-hmm. But You know, there's a pretty good spread between audience and critic gap. 
you know, 76 for audience, 54 for... Oh, damn. What were your thoughts on that movie? I'm probably in the 50 range. He's very good in the role, but I just didn't love the story. Okay. I recommend people watch it just to see Hoffman's work, but that's really it. Okay. And to see him as a leading man, right? Like, at this point, it's all supporting until this point in his career. Mm -hmm. So, for that reason, it's worth checking out if you're interested. But then, 2002, smaller role. He's in Punch Drunk Love as Dean, which will definitely be our outgoing words for this episode, 100%. (laughs) Shut up! Shut up! Shut, 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 shut up! He's awesome small role but he's fantastic yeah he's he's entertaining in it for sure just screaming his head off at adam sandler (laughs) as a sketchy businessman in that one uh 2002 he gets lit on fire and sent down a a hill in a wheelchair and red dragon is freddy again spoiler alert (laughs) he's just a piece of shit in that movie (laughs) he's so good another and he's named freddy again i think this is like his third time (laughs) being named freddy Kyle, I like how you just got right to the point. He's set on fire in a wheelchair. <laughs> uh, Warren, I appreciate you sending the South Park photo because I totally forgot that was part of South Park back in the day. Do, I was like, do oh, you yeah. See, you see what- <laughs> yeah, that was exactly what they were making fun of. 2002, he's in 25th Hour as Jacob. Uh, I read that Ebert loved that movie and his role. He's he's like a really antisocial, awkward teacher who's in love with one of his students. So it's very Philip Seymour Hoffman-esque, I would say. In 2003, he crosses over with our boy Gabriel Byrne on the theater side in Long Day's Journey into Night. And he got a Tony nomination for his role. And then also in 03, he's in, as Warren called it, the Canadian version of uncut gems and owning mahoney he plays dan the lead character as a gambling addict it's based off a true story too in the 80s this guy was working for a bank and has a little bit of track debt and gets big into skimming money off of loans and then going to atlantic city and losing money and then skimming money off of loans He's not a stellar in the movie by any means. He's he's got a pretty solid Canadian accent, and his mm-hmm. girlfriend's Mini Driver. I was I was kind of bored watching it, Warren. So, I, not my favorite Philip Seymour Hoffman movie. Yeah, you know, at least at least Uncut Gems had you thinking, like you're a little bit on edge of your seat, saying yeah. like this is what's going to happen here. This, but you just watching, you're just like, oh, he's going to lose all the fucking money. Guess what? He's going to lose all the fucking money. He's going to lose yeah. all the fucking money. <laughs> It's more likely than not you're going to lose the money here. Yeah. Ribs with no sauce and a Coke. This guy's a fucking psychopath. <laughs> there was one scene that I remember, and that's when he's up big time, and they're like communicating back to the boss. And I remember him saying, you can correct me with the exact words, but he's like, send someone there and fucking take out his knees with a pipe. Like, get him off the floor immediately, because this asshole is going to lose everything he's gained. I laughed at that part. There's that line, and then another part when he's up, like, three mil, and they're like, oh my god, what are we going to do? And he goes, come back to me at 4 a.m., and he's lost all his money by then. <laughs> oh. Addict. So, I mean, the movie, it, it really isn't good. It's interesting that it's a true story and everything, um, but I would much rather hear about the what the mayor of Toronto <laughs> wasn't. <laughs> that, that, guy, that guy was a fucking nut. The coke nut? Still alive? That guy? Yeah. No, I think, he, I think he died. Is Rob, Ro- Rob, whatever, what's his name? Rob, Rob Ford? Ford? He's dead. Let's, yeah, take, a, he let's died. take a vote. Let's take a vote. Who thinks he's alive? He's Who's definitely he? dead. I'm, should I'm he be blown. dead? Yes. I think he he's died. dead. He, he should, we like get a, Will, should we get Will Sasso to play him? He had like <laughs> a, he died of like a brain tumor like five years ago, I think. A tumor? Yeah. Let's yeah, he died, he died in, 20, in 2016. Oh, yeah, Honestly, March 22nd, 2016, oh, almost <laughs> five years ago. Almost five years ago to the death. <laughs> we just summoned Rob Ford. Oh, God. The, the place right, I did Peter. not expect to go today was <laughs> to Rob Ford. Yeah. Um, oh, shit. So, this got scary. What, so, which is interesting, the first couple, the two movies we've mentioned where he is a lead are probably two of the lesser projects we've talked about in Love Lies and Owning Mahoney. Take that in however you will. I don't know what that really means, but 
he's in Cold Mountain in 03 and the first of a couple like religious roles as Reverend VC. And he co-stars with Lucas Black, who is in the Fast and Furious <laughs> franchise. <laughs> in terms of, like the most famous actor from the Fast and Furious franchise that he co-stars with. Is that the crossovers I need to start calculating in all that the Fast and Furious crossovers? Dude, that was forget forget Craig. the Munsons. When I saw that stat, I was blown away. There's way too many normally, so you don't want to touch That's that. That's true. We have to isolate the the few instances. <laughs> so, oh four, we we run into lowest critic score, and that is Warren's review of Along Came Polly. Did we lose him? Oh, <clears throat> we lost him. Our medical <clears throat> doctor. <clears throat> <clears throat> he's gone method this movie itself if you take out philip seymour often's character this movie is like 10 percent on rotten tomatoes (laughs) um he him and hank azaria carry the whole movie and Alec Baldwin, too. He's fucking hilarious in mm-hmm. this as well. <laughs> but, like, from the first second that PSH steps on screen, he's walking in, like, a very <laughs> ill-fitting tuxedo at Ben Stiller's <laughs> wedding, and he falls so hard on a dance floor to point out that they had just waxed a dance floor <laughs> too much. <laughs> um, I mean, and he eats it so hard, and it, it's it's hilarious. <laughs> and every single scene that he is in is like absolutely laughable. Like I laughed in every single bit of it. My <laughs> wife and I watched it. You know, after after that part, Same he here, does. Dude. Yeah, he does the the elevator going to the art show. Oh man, I'm so freaking horny. <laughs> And that's when he he exposes everybody to the word shart. You know, is that yep. the first time you've ever heard that word? That was the first time I heard the word shart. It definitely I was agree. for me too. Yeah, it like triggered a PTSD. I was like, "Is this where I got the word from?" And like immediately, I remembered that. The crazy <laughs> thing is, like, if you told me when the, when I was like, "Oh, I'm doing this," I was like, oh, "Along came Polly." That's gonna be what, like, 2010? No. 2004 like holy shit yeah i i i was way off i'm way off on everything with philip seymour hoffman in Uh time timelines he's just funny in absolutely everything in this it was very especially compared to everything else he's done while he does have bits of humor that are more mature and everything like that this this shows that he has 100 percent the ability to play a comedic actor and for anybody who hasn't seen it he was basically in a version of like 16 candles as a loser kid. And he plays bagpipes, which is like <laughs> the best, the one of the best MacGuffins in like a, ch- like a rom-com. And you never learn anything about it. And, you know, he, he just keeps living in the past about this. I mean, seriously, everything Brain he dance. says, everything. Yeah. Basketball. I was going to say, I haven't played a pickup basketball game where someone hasn't made that joke. It's yeah. still historic. Let it rain. To this day. I, yeah. <laughs> and, hey, hey, you douchebags, bring your A game. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm what? Just, kidding, just messing with you, Sasquatch. Let's get it on. <laughs> you know, it, seriously, like, this was Weird. such like especially I think I'd watch this after watching Heart Eight, Boogie Nights, and something else just wow. as a refresher. Yeah. And it is like on it, you could just watch his clips, him and Alec Baldwin's clips on YouTube for six minutes, and that's that's all you need to watch from this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I can totally see why it doesn't hit as a movie among critics because. I mean, it is what it is. It's Ben Stiller, an absolute vintage Ben Stiller of yep. getting in awkward uh, scenarios. And so I, them landing Philip Seymour Hoffman for this role is, I mean, I don't know how it really happened. <laughs> it seems like they definitely benefited from it. And my opinion, he benefited from it as well, just for a, like a diversity sake even though the movie yeah. itself wasn't that good it says something that he is the most memorable person in his lowest critic score yeah yeah oh five he earned a primetime emmy nomination for best supporting actor in his role as charlie in empire falls which is available on hbo so check that out 
It's a two-parter, so basically four hours worth, and that takes us right to his highest critic score. So if we go straight from lowest critic to highest critic, so the full spectrum to his Oscar-winning role as Capote, and Case is going to talk about it. His uh, character in Capote is nothing like his character in A Long Game Poly. <laughs> <laughs> Negative. They're very different ends of the spectrum. Capote is a uh, 2005 biographical pick about Truman Capote. And those that don't know who Truman Capote is, he was a very high-profile author and socialite during the 60s and 70s. And uh, the film is actually based on an autobiography by Gerald Clark. And the film was actually released on uh, September 30th, which is Capote's birthday. Hmm. The film is based on the time period where Capote wrote his book called In Cold Blood, which was about the brutal and high-profile murder of a Kansas family in 1959. Story follows is Capote, and I thought this was really interesting, Nell Harper Lee, who wrote To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. The two of them traveled to Kansas to investigate and write about this gruesome crime. And while they're out there, Capote befriends many of the major people involved with this murder investigation, including the two suspects who were later convicted. And he grows particularly fond of one. He's interviewing everybody and becoming close to them so he could write real deeply about the experience. Hmm. You know, the movie is a super well-crafted look at Capote's personal life, his professional life, and then kind of the methods he used to try to write what he was hoping to be an epic novel. You know, I won't go too far into the plot because, you know, I don't want this to sound like a book report, but, you know, it's a really good movie and it's definitely worth checking out. And Hoffman is, he's fantastic in this role. I've watched this several times before this. And when I was getting ready for the podcast, I did some research and I found some interviews from Johnny Carson of Truman Capote. And so I watched those and then I rewatched this movie Mm -hmm. after watching those clips, man, and watching this movie again. He, I mean, Hoffman nailed it. His portrayal is spot on. It's no wonder that, you know, he was given an Oscar for this role in episodes of the past. And and we've even brought this up a couple times already. We've lamented over like other actors that could have played this role and been good in it. After watching this movie and seeing those interviews, I mean, in my opinion, I think Philip Hoffman's incredibly perfect for this role. Oh, yeah. Which is why he won all the awards. Overall, you guys, a super good movie. If you haven't seen it, you need to get out and watch it. Yeah, I watched it yesterday for the first time. Halfway through, I had to watch an interview as well just to like verify that that was how Capote sounded. And he wasn't just doing an impression of Droopy Dog. (laughs) (laughs) I was blown away. Initially, like I was laughing because I was like, no way does he actually sound like this. My wife was like, you're so uneducated. And (laughs) (laughs) she knows you well, man. She kind of walked me through everything. And I was like, I'd heard the name and everything, but I didn't know like all the stuff that he had written. Yeah. You know, then she was like, you need to just watch this, watch this interview and listen to him. And I did. I was like, holy crap. He does nail it. It's unbelievable. In a row, I watched Along Came Polly. And then after that, I watched Capote (laughs) to see him go in a year from one (laughs) role to the other. Not only does he look like he's lost like 40 pounds, like he is so much tinier in Capone, Mm -hmm. but he is like absorbed into that role where i was yeah. blown away that he was like the doofus child actor and then it was this serious like he completely transformed all right so following capote one for one out of the gate with his oscar nom in 2005 he's in a crossover with alice and janney and strangers with candy and then in 2006 he plays the bad guy in mission impossible 3 he is just so dark and yeah. he doesn't have to bring much to it, but his demeanor. It's nonverbal. It's his body language. He was beating the shit out of Tom Cruise. And Lauren was like, oh, man, he's really going for it. I was like, yeah. Like, he, he just like. <laughs> the man he's commits. Just, he's, he's just fucked up. He's dark. <laughs> and he's rich. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you really kind of learn that, like, you don't have to be a physically demanding presence to be a successful heavy. And he mm-hmm. does it. Well, in a movie that's set up for Tom Cruise to be the star of the show and people remember Philip Seymour Hoffman in this movie, that's a massive sign that how great he was. One of the things that I really admire about him is I like his performances. I don't think he steps on the toes of his co-stars at all. It's really a, a really strong play mm. one over the other. And he may mm. be more memorable, but he doesn't 
take it in a way that it inhibits, you know, I'm thinking through doubt, I won't get ahead of ourselves here, but he's on the screen with some great actors and mm -hmm. it's just a really good play. I think that's a tribute to him because you definitely see some actors that kind of step on the co-stars a little mm -hmm. bit. No, that's, that's a great point. I agree a hundred percent. A less is more thing. And he's, right. he's mastered that. I think it's a great point too, because it goes to a stage work because you have to. Right? right, like if you're when you're in front of a group night after night like that, you have to work really well alongside your co-actors. So I think it's a great point, Mike. All right, so 2007, he gets a Golden Globe nom for his role as John in The Savages. 2007 as well, he's in Before the Devil Knows Your Dead is Andy, which is his number three IMDb credit. It's a good movie. This is Sidney Lumet's last movie. Plot in this is insanely fucked up. Yeah, they rob their parents' jewelry store. Him and Ethan Hawke. They go buy drugs with it from Keith <laughs> David and get some <laughs> double sided <laughs> double <-sided laughs> up their asses. Nope, different movie. Oh. Him and Ethan Hawke are playing off of each other so masterfully in this movie. It's a really good movie, and he's great in it. He plays. We talked about range in his career. He has as much range in this movie. Like his character's ranges are so extreme in this movie. And, and he does a great job with it. I've seen some scenes where he's, he's got a lot of fire in his character, where he's emotionally just overwhelming towards uh, in his scenes. But, I mean, look at the sporting cast. It's Ethan Hawke, Albert Finney, Marissa Tomei, Michael Shannon, Amy Ryan, Rosemary Harris. I mean, that's just, that's not even fair. Well, speaking of good movies, Charlie Wilson's War. He plays Gust, and he got Oscar, Golden Globe, and BAFTA noms. And that, let me tell you, boys, that stash is thick in that movie. It is thick. That fight he gets into mm -hmm. in his first scene is fucking great. Is that the one where he breaks the glass? Yeah, with the dude from uh, Mad Men. I forget the guy's mm -hmm. name, the guy with the white hair. I thought it was absolutely hysterical. I was really impressed. I've never heard the story either. A yeah, guy who uh, did political science and then worked in politics <laughs> in Texas would have heard about Charlie Wilson, but uh, I must have not paid attention for that month in school. <laughs> Has Tom Hanks played like a scumbag like this much in his career? I feel like he always plays the good guy. Dude, he, he's got just enough Hanks charm on it where like, oh yeah, you're like he's not he's not yeah. a full scumbag. I mean, yeah, that's exactly how Charlie Wilson was. Yeah. He was a, like a ladies' man. You know, he, he just did all that stuff. And Gus was, I mean, those glasses too. Oh, yeah. He, it was like Dick Cheney going hunting. <laughs> <laughs> when I think about hit Philip Seymour Hoffman in, in whatever role, just ambiguously, this is the kind of role that I think of him in. And just, mm -hmm. he's so confident. He knows his stuff. He's a little bit, you know, throws away kind of some of these comments. He's a little bit subdued. But like dude's packing a punch on screen uh, yeah. and and with anybody else who he's in the room with this role is like typical uh phil hoffman yep, for me i agree oh wait we're gonna talk a little bit about cynic dochi new york i think i got that one right he plays Kate i think it's i think it's connected <laughs> synecdoche <laughs> um, <laughs> new york Sinek dacha Hop Hog New York. Represent. All you need to know, and we prelude, we give a little prelude last episode on this one, is that this movie is batshit crazy, and he plays the leading role as kind of a theater director, and it's really hard to describe. So I don't know yeah. how much we, we need to talk about it, other than it is a very memorable role for him, but it is a very weird movie. It's a mind bender, and that's not for everybody, you know? And it's a part you got to be in a particular mood to watch this kind of movie, that's for sure. But you know what isn't a movie that you need to be in a particular mood to watch? Doubt. It's about priests molesting kids. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect transition. Great dude. transition, man. <laughs> Great. It's a little bit about molestation, a little about uh, being gay and black and everything. Like it. Yeah. It seriously hits on everything. I remember, I, I checked the year on this multiple times because it was like, I thought all this hit the fan in like the early 2000s in Boston. And it was, it was nuts that like, this is from the sixties, right? Uh, yeah. 60s, 50s, something like that. This was sixties um, in New York. Yeah. Just like totally displaced from the other storyline that you're used to hearing with this kind of film. The cast in this movie is unreal. Meryl yeah. Streep, Viola Davis, Amy Adams, and Philip Seymour Hoffman. I mean, you could argue that those four, I mean, Meryl uh -huh. Streep's been doing it for years, but you could argue that those four are top of their game. Right. Like if you were to list the top 10 actors for the last 30 years, I mean, those four are probably in that list, you know, this is so Rigby, you mentioned it. Um, he works with Amy Adams a lot. I mean, part of that is working with PTA because he casts her and things. But I think he's in like four different movies with Amy Adams, including Charlie Wilson's war, which we just talked about. 
we didn't mention for his role in Doubt as Father Flynn. He got an Oscar, Golden Globe, BAFTA, and Sagnom. So another one of those films like Charlie Wilson's War where he just cleans it up. As long as you watch the last, you know, the argument that happens between him and Meryl Streep, that's an unreal just performance mm. right there from both of them. Like it, it, she honestly does it all and she kills it. She's got the accent and, and like he, he has not to this point missed an accent and I am a stickler for accents. Yes. And you he are. fucking kills accents every time mm-hmm. kills them. That scene you were talking about was where it, it really became apparent to me. And I referenced it a minute ago, but it was like, that was where you've got two, heavy hitters just going all out and neither one of them is stepping on the other one. It's just totally complimenting. Mm -hmm. You could, you could, you could watch that camera angle on either one of them for the whole scene and love it. It wouldn't change it one bit, but there's just, Mm -hmm. there's so much. It's so good. And this is his third nomination in three years, four years at this point. Yeah. Yeah. He was on a tear. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. 2009, he crosses over with a couple months in, in Pirate Radio with uh, Chris O'Dowd and Emma Thompson as the Count, and follows that up with his role in The Invention of Lying. Very small role. He plays Jim the bartender, but I want to read you all a screenshot that I pulled because I think it'll, it will give you some good context as to why he took on the role. It is a movie with Ricky, Ricky Gervais, Gervais yeah. where uh-huh. so where he he learns he lives in a world where no one can lie except for him. He's he's the only person that can lie. And so he's weaponizing that. And Gervais is the one who financed the movie. And he said, when trying to secure Philip Seymour Hoffman for his cameo, his agent claimed he was too busy. So Ricky Gervais requested his email address and sent him the following. Dear Philip, will you please appear in my new film? There is very little money involved as I spent the budget on testicular implants. But don't look upon them as my testicles. Look look at them as our testicles. Philip Seymour Hoffman <laughs> couldn't refuse after that. <laughs> so, that's hilarious. So I that's, thought that's awesome because he's just he's in like one scene as a bartender. It's very brief, but you know, a quick story about testicular implants just sold him on the role. So there you go. His meter just went up on mine. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> um, and then finally, in 2009, again, range. He plays kind of a caricature of himself in the show Arthur, which I think a lot of us watched when we were kids. It was still on in 2009. I think it's still on today, actually. As William Fillmore Toffman, he won a Daytime Emmy, or he got a Daytime Emmy nomination for Outstanding Performer in an Animated Program for his role as a theater teacher in that show. Awesome. Fun facts. Arthur was a great show growing up. Great Every show. day when you're walking down. Iconic. What is it? Ziggy Marley did the... um theme song for that good Mm -hmm. show i agree rigby and that takes us to 2010 so we're all the way in the 2010s kind of rounding out his career and we're going to talk about his largest critic gap which is jack goes boating james got it the critics gave this a 68 the audience gave it a 48 and we wanted to cover it because this is philip seymour hoffman's directorial debut he is also playing the title character of jack so the character is like a shy awkward guy who uh, drives a limo and his co-worker and his wife feel sorry for him and so they set him up on a blind date with a character by the name of connie who's played by amy ryan and she's great she's essentially playing like the character she was in the office but like instead of it being like happy-go-lucky fun michael scott it's like this person's a little bit like on the spectrum maybe and they need like special help and they're trying to set her and uh philip seymour hoffman up and i think this movie like you it was originally a play and you can tell when you watch it it's like four main characters and the the characters have a tremendous amount of depth and each actor is like great in those roles but the movie just like doesn't flow it doesn't like pack the emotional punch that it thinks it should or like certain scenes should and what's sad is like you can tell that philip seymour hoffman had a skill for this when it came to directing but like this was like the start of it and because he's him we we expect it to be this like amazing movie because he's an amazing actor and it's really just like okay and because it's him people make it's like oh it's terrible i would split it like right down the middle and say it's probably still failing for me but in like the 50s i'd rate it 
I agree. I found myself not investing too much into the characters, and while Philip does a really good job, like convincing you of his plight, his character's plight, I just mm-hmm. I found the characters to be kind of a drag to watch, and it is yeah. definitely had a very much a theater feel to it that I didn't I didn't fall in love with. It sounds like he's done better directing on the stage than he did in this movie. Yeah, and I wouldn't Especially be shocked by that. that. Yep. Yeah, I don't think it got nominated for any awards. No Razzies either, so... You know, no, it was right, just... Right in the like, middle, baby. It was... For a debut, you'd be like, oh, nice, but it's unfortunate that we won't see, like, where it goes. All right, that's Jack Goes Boating. Let's round this thing out. 2011, he's in The Ides of March, plays a character named Paul, another fantastic character in a movie about politics with an absolutely stacked cast, and Ryan Gosling just showing off. This is, like, the third adapted play that he had done in a couple of years, which I really pre- I appreciate, you know, some successfully, some not, but I appreciate his mm-hmm. lesbian nature coming to the mm-hmm. screen. Cause I think you get good crossover that way, not just from the audience, but you also get a cast that maybe is a little more diversified there and brings something a little different mm-hmm. to the stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is a good movie. He, and his character's good. I think he, he plays the stressed out campaign manager really well. I think he's like smoking a cigarette in every scene he's in. And just yep. overworked and not enough sleep. Like Gus. Manipulative. I like his character at the end when he's like, maybe one day we'll sit down and have a beer and figure out what you had on, uh, yeah. on Clooney. So you yep. can figure out why you took my job. When I was uh, watching this movie, it was another one of those movies where I was like, God damn it, Gosling's so good. It's like, every time he's, <laughs> I just think he steals every, like, every movie he's in. He just, it's like, oh, I thought he was going to suck. I really did. <laughs> it's got to hurt to be that talented and that attractive, right, James? Yeah, he's just good at everything. Sounds like somebody else I know. Um, <laughs> yeah, leave me out of this. <laughs> uh, 2011, we got a crossover with Chris Pratt in Moneyball. He plays Art Howe, the uh, the manager of the Oakland Athletics. This role is interesting because I remember when this came out, it was a very divisive role because Art Howe was like portrayed as this dick who like went against everything that Billy Bean and the Moneyball saber metrics and all that stuff were trying to do and Art Howe was like what the hell was that like the real Art Howe was like I was not like that at all oh interesting it's nothing against Philip Seymour Hoffman they just needed a antagonist and I think unfortunately yeah unfortunately Art Howe's <laughs> character <laughs> took the plunge there so when your antagonist is uh people who don't like data you're like uh that's not going to be really fun to <laughs> let's just make some asshole somewhere yeah cool it's our manager yeah at the same time if they made a movie about me and it was completely true and it made me look like a dick I would say oh my god no that, that couldn't be more <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> more <laughs> wrong. great point great point I, I, I never thought of it that way. I would fucking deny everything. Be like, nothing in that movie is true. <laughs> <laughs> who are you going to believe me or a bunch of losers who can't beat the Yankees in the playoffs? <laughs> <laughs> the next year, he rounds out, gets his fourth Oscar nomination along with Golden Globe, BAFTA, and SAG noms for his role in the much discussed and much maligned movie that we've talked about many times on the pod, and that's his role as Lancaster Dodd in 2012's The Master, a crossover with our boy Rami Malek. So, Munson's who aren't Warren or Kyle, did you watch this movie? How did you feel about it? I did. I've never I, I've seen it, but just like bits and pieces, so I'm not going to chime in. Yeah, I, I haven't seen The Master in, since... I, I didn't watch it for the Rami Malek one either, but I no. didn't watch it for this one. Mike, but, what do you down to you? Yeah, so I, I did watch it. I definitely enjoyed it. I'm a big fan of like the cult, the cult movies personally. And it's interesting to see how they all have their different takes on it. You know, you get a little bit of like that Scientology taste in this one. But mm-hmm. man, Joaquin Phoenix is just, again, just like does what he does. And he's just, just out there. Like dude has so many issues and you mm-hmm. just, PSH just crushes it as like the cult leader of just like, bringing you in and like, you know, with one hand ushering you in and with the other, like covering your ears and eyes to the world. Great as a cult leader because he just bleeds confidence uh, mm-hmm. in a role that he plays. And so, and that's what you need in someone like that. Mm-hmm. So it, it was really enjoyable again, just for the, for the performances on the screen. I appreciate you giving that response because I wanted to say this to Kyle and Warren, you guys successfully turned off the other three Munsons on this podcast from watching that movie with your argument over it to the point where 
our boy was nominated for Academy Award, and three of us were like, I don't want to watch that movie at all. Dude. Do, you remember, <laughs> do you remember Kyle and Warren fighting about that? <laughs> and it wasn't even that much of a fight. It was like Warren's like, I like the performances. I don't really like the movie. And I'm like, I like the movie, but it's not great. And that was the crux of our argument. No. Couldn't I couldn't agree more with Kyle here. Um, <laughs> like, I don't know if I'll ever watch the movie again because I've already watched it twice, which is one more time than I ever expected to watch it. <laughs> but his and Joaquin Phoenix's acting is... Inc- it really is incredible to see what they do. And his role in this is honestly like an amalgamation of all the roles that he's done to this point where he's not stepping on anybody's toes. He shows a very joyous role. And then five seconds later, he is turning red and shaking in anger and it's long speeches and a little, little bit of humor and he covers everything more on the spectrum of acting in this role than anybody else we've ever covered. Very Jekyll and Hyde. Yes. That's high praise right there. Yeah, that's fantastic. That is not what I expected to hear. When you're considered possibly the best character actor of your generation, you get to be picky on what you want to do. Absolutely. At that point in time. For sure. So probably my favorite story about Philip Seymour Hoffman, age 16 to 2012, however long that was, he played the same role that he played all those years ago. He played Willie Loman. He played the same character in the same play all those years later, and he got a Tony nomination for his role. I think that's the coolest Mm -hmm. Philip Seymour Hoffman story. The role that kind of put him on the map and started to get eyes on him as a young actor is the same one that got him his last award recognition as an actor before he died. I think that's really cool. That's cool. The 2012 revival of Death of a Salesman was hosted at a theater on Broadway in New York that my family member has actually managed for like over 30 years. And I always ask him all the time, hey, like any interesting celebrity stories? And he, you know, provides me one here or there. And he provided me one when it came to Philip Seymour Hoffman, specifically in this role. So this The cast of this play was like star studded for Broadway, where it was like Bill Camp, who's uh, recently was the janitor in Queen's Gambit, Andrew Garfield. This is the same year that he was Spider Man, right? So, this is, you know, the hype of Andrew Garfield and Philip Seymour Hoffman. Only went for a few months, obviously got the Tony Awards, the whole deal. Part of my uncle's job is when, you know, VIPs are there and they want to. You know, meet one whoever's performing on you know in the play or something. He either brings them before or after the performance to meet the star. And one night, Annette Bening was there and wanted to meet Philip Seymour Hoffman after the performance. And he ghosted her by sneaking out the back door. <laughs> and so the next night, Annette Bening came back with her husband Warren Beatty, <laughs> and they wanted to meet Philip Seymour Hoffman, dismissing it the night before as like an accident. And so the couple who has 19 Oscar nominations between them and were actually personal (laughs) friends of Philip Seymour Hoffman, uh, they went to go meet him and he actually snuck out a different exit to avoid them. And so (laughs) now the third night in a row, Warren Beatty shows up, tries to speak with Philip Seymour Hoffman now because he's concerned about his friend. And so they made sure like, hey, he, he can't go through this exit, can't go through that exit. And what he did was he walked back on stage and walked out with the general audience to avoid speaking to <laughs> straight Joker style. Wow. Three number. straight <laughs> nights in a row he ghosted Annette Benning and Warren Beatty. I mean, I kind of respect <laughs> I kind of respect the commitment. Honestly. Yeah. So like obviously like we weren't aware of it at the time. So like when my uncle shared that story with me, he's like, I've never seen someone be like that disrespectful to, you know, their friends before in my life. And now you look back and it's like, oh, that's when he relapsed with drugs. Yeah. And it's like, ah, oh, now you kind of have a different understanding of the story. But at that time, my uncle's like, I've never seen anything like that before in my life. It certainly doesn't excuse it, but it certainly helps explain probably why his behavior right. was the way it was, mm-hmm. which is perfect. Because I had drug relapse on the show now. It's 2012. So, so as we kind of round things out. He uh, gets himself hooked up in the Hunger Games universe. He, he does three Hunger Games movies. So he's in Catching Fire. Then he's in Mockingjay Parts 1 and 2, which is some big block, blockbuster movies for someone who's done 
build a pretty yeah. successful career in indie films. You know, I think so. at that point he was cashing like a big old check because he's only oh, yeah. in those movies for like a few minutes. So my mm-hmm. guess is it's like, hey, will you put your name on this movie and we'll throw you 10 mil? And he's like, absolutely. His partner, Mimi O'Donnell at the time, they started transitioning all of the money and the resources to her. Yeah, I mean. As, as this was going on, because I think, I think they saw the problems coming. When someone relapses, it's not very private for the people that, you know, are their loved ones. So yeah. they, they saw yeah. this happening and were like, all right, we got to figure something out. Well, and he had three kids too. So that I'm sure that only complicated the situation as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, Trying to be a dad as well as a husband and a full-time actor and on the stage and on screen. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. I think I remember at this time, like hearing about the relapse and him going into rehab. Like I, you know, it wasn't much before this time where I was like, oh, I remember hearing that via, you know, I don't know if it was fucking like a TMZ equivalent or something where it was like, oh, yeah, Philip Seymour Hoffman's back into rehab. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, that, that's just one of the first times I remember it being like public news. Yeah. And, and this was like right around the time that like, like Twitter was starting to get. Big yeah. So around media. this yeah, time, too. Yeah. So there's like videos of him like looking bad and in public and stuff. So it was it sucked. And when they say back into rehab, like the last time he was in rehab was in the late 80s. So yeah, yeah, for a dude. lot of people, they're like back into it. I didn't even know he was there in the first place. Twenty five yeah. years sober. One of his last movies that we'll note is A Most Wanted Man. He plays Gunther. And in the accent world, Warren, what's your assessment? Because I know this was one of the first ones you saw. I thought it was perfectly fine. Yeah, I, I did too. It wasn't too over the top. And it was just enough where you could say like, oh, yeah, I could see uh, yeah. a guy who was a a German citizen you know, speaking in English where it was just enough to make you feel yeah. like if, if I closed my eyes and listened, I would said a, a, a German American accent, you know, 100 percent. And so, yeah, you know, and that doesn't make me a uh, I'm not a uh, professional, but uh, I've, I've heard enough and paid <laughs> enough attention to people talking in movies to you're our um, accent expert here. You're the certainly the most cultured. So we're going to go to you on that every time. At least self-proclaimed, right? And that's more than we could say for the rest of us. Yep, that's right. <laughs> Any German who says that that accent didn't sound German just doesn't want to admit that their accent is ugly because yeah. I grew up with that accent and that's what it sounds like and it's ugly and you just got <laughs> to move on. It's like, oh, he doesn't sound German. He's like, no, he does and it's okay. It's just not a pretty accent. And the movie was decent. I think it's got a decent story. I know it. I think it premiered at Sundance back in 2014. Um, I saw an interview with the director where he was showing a scene from the movie where they only filmed, they only took one one shot of it, and it was the scene where they're on the boat and he's meeting his informant. The director is just talking about how impressive Hoffman's body language was. He was like, it was the perfect cut. Like I, I didn't feel any need to have to film it a second time, which is amazing. I feel like, I don't know, Mike, you could tell me, but I feel like that probably doesn't happen all the time to where you get it right on the first take. Ballsy man. Your editors hate you uh, unless you got a talent <laughs> like that. I feel like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's. I mean, there's just that's the thing too. Is as you can imagine, there's just so many things that can go can go wrong on set in any given take, and so mm-hmm. to go with one, you gotta love it. But as a director, you know, with that kind of experience, it's the right call. Apparently, yeah. Available on Tubi and on Prime, I believe. If y'all want to check it out, and so just a couple weeks after Sundance. In 2014, he is unfortunately found dead in his apartment of a heroin overdose. He was supposed to pick up his kids the next morning, didn't show up, went to his apartment and found him unconscious with, I think I read 70, like 60, 70 bags of heroin. I mean, there was a lot there. In those like final months leading up to it, they'd, he, they'd film most of his role for the final Hunger Games movie. I think they had a week left of filming, so they they just made it work, did some CGI things to round out his role there. He was supposed to be in the pilot for Happy-ish that premiered in 2015, um, but they replaced him with Steve Coogan once that happened. But that is the unfortunate end of a fantastic career for someone who mm-hmm. I could only imagine what he would have brought us over the past five, six years um, if he had continued. Obviously, any po- PTA movies he would have been in, but I mean, other than that, there's no telling what else he would have brought us. I think of of the two celebrity deaths that have kind of, I guess three that have shocked me the most the last like 
six, seven years. This is up there along with Robin Williams and Kobe Bryant. Mm-hmm. You kind of remember where you were when you found out that they that they passed. I remember this because this was Super Bowl Sunday too when Philip Seymour Hoffman passed. We're going to get to our, our scores, but I think it goes without saying that he was a remarkable actor. And like you said, Kyle, the stuff that he could have done, I mean, the stuff that we could be talking about right now had he not gone too soon, who knows? I mean, he he probably definitely would have been nominated for probably a few more Oscars, probably won some. I mean, he really was like one of the best actors of his generation. And so, yeah, his death hit me hard for sure. One of the things I really liked that he said was, I like to keep my life private because when you watch a movie, I don't want you to have like a preconceived notion about who I am. Mm-hmm. And so that I can portray, I can portray an actor wholeheartedly. Like interesting, my thoughts on oh, that's cool. politics or my thoughts on something else should have no sway on how you view the character that I play. And yep. so that kind of takes a a side turn from some of the people that we do, and they're very vocal on certain things. So we'll see how that plays out. To your question, though, I, I remember I, I did a little research on this too to try to relive what was going on at the time. It's like um, Amy O'Donnell did a like a brief interview with USA Today. It does say she was quoted as saying that, his, or I guess it's not a quote per se, but it was uh, seeing the crumbling of his friend's marriages after unfaithfulness, his longtime therapist succumbing to cancer, falling out with plans in AA and a love-hate relationship with acting. Uh, goes on to say that uh, he occasionally would have a drink or two, which was a red flag. Of course, that led into prescription opioids, mm-hmm. everything bad from there. So right. it sounds like he was just dealing with a lot of a lot of stress, as is probably the case with most of these things, other things yeah. going on in his life that started. Compounding on each other. And because you're putting out, he's putting out world-class work, people are probably just like... Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, he's showing up on time. Like, what's the big deal? And it's like, nah, dude, he's going through some shit. And then finally, in terms of kind of his legacy that he left behind, the American Playwriting Foundation um, created a scholarship in his memory, uh, $45,000 that they give out annually uh, to an author of an unproduced play. It's called The Relentless Prize, which is a pretty cool way to commemorate his his dedication to, the, to theater. And then um, also important to note, Sam Rockwell and Kate Blanchett both dedicated their Oscar wins to him mm-hmm. on stage, which is a, a pretty cool moment as well. Because Blanchett was with him in uh, Ripley, right? Uh, yep. They weren't even in a scene together. Right? They must have just hung out in Italy. Sounds nice. Him and Rockwell never even worked together, but he directed Rockwell when Rockwell was doing uh, plays in New York. Yep. Oh, I remember cool. him saying, he said, this one's for Phil Hoffman. Uh, talk about world-class actors. There's another one for you. All right. Well, top performance of Rigby. There's a lot to pick from, so I'm very interested in what kind of list you have for us. When he died, a lot of people came out with their own sort of lists. I was going to do one from Time Magazine, but it came out, again, like I mentioned, like three days after he died. So I went with this list from The Decider – from Decider.com, it was from 2017, and it's actually a list of top 50 roles. We're only going to do the top 10, but I think <laughs> because it's because it's a definitive list and it's and it's ranked, I think we should do this one. Yeah. I almost made a joke as you were saying it. it was it his top 60 roles? <laughs> it's li- listen. I, I think that the fact that this that this writer ranked her personal top 50, I think we should give her some give her some her due. So let's do. Yeah. I'm in. Let's do, instead of 50, let's just do the top 10. And this is in numerical order. Capote's got to be one. Capote is number six. What? Okay. What about the master? The master is number one, Warren. There you go. Hey, it. Right. This, I this, told you this, it was damn, this, damn good acting. Movies this ranking right just there. lost Movies all credibility for half of your podcasters. <laughs> <laughs> nah, hey, Warren gave it the highest praise, man. He said it's the best work of acting we've had of anyone we've covered yet. So, yep. Before the devil knows you're dead. Uh, nope. Doubt. Doubt yeah. is number 11. So just outside the top. 10. Oh, what a Charlie Wilson's war. That's not in the top 10 either. I thought it would be flawless. Nope. Ooh. Oh, wow. Talented Mr. Ripley. Nope. Almost famous. Yes. Almost famous is number two. Lester bangs. Ooh. Twister. Twister is not in the top 10. <sighs> oh, good most good wanted grief. man. Most wanted man is number 10. Nice job. Ooh. Uh, give me mission impossible. 
Yeah. Mission Impossible is number nine. Good one. All right, so we need we eight, go. seven, five. So came Polly. Is that on there? Uh, yeah, but it's not on the top ten. Synecdoche. Sinindochi. Synecdoche is number eight. Nice job, yeah. Kyle. There we go. Ides of March. Yeah, nope. Ides of March. Nope. Owning Mahoney. Nope. Punch Chunk Love. No. The one where he's set on fire in a wheelchair. No. <laughs> Set of, set, of, <laughs> set of a woman. Nope. Boogie Nights. Boogie oh. Nights is five. Yes. Nice job, Scotty. The Big Lebowski. Hunger Games part one, two, and three. <laughs> no to either of those. Oh, my God. Happiness. Wow. Happiness is four. Nice job. I Kyle. told you. Yeah, everyone loves that fucking movie, man. I don't think we've said three. It. We haven't said three, and we haven't said seven yet. Magnolia. I Magnolia is three. Nice job. Seven, I don't think we, we mentioned, but I don't think we got into very much. The Savages. Yes, The Savages, Kyle. Nice job. Nice. I thought this was a pretty cool list, and it came out yeah, man. three years after he passed, so I thought let the ink dry a little bit before we get into a list, and I thought this was a good one. So, Who was the list by? Decider is the, is the site, and it's written by a writer for them named Jade Budowski. Classic Jade. So yeah, good job, classic. Jade. Let's get into the Munson meter. For every actor, we rate them on a scale of 0 to 100 based on a variety of factors. Those factors could include longevity, project choice, pop culture impact, acting range, awards, footprint, if they have any other talents, personal life, comedic chops, box office success or lack thereof, and anything else that matters to us. And we will start with Case this time. He was such an amazing actor, and and I think... You know, we lost him during what could have been an amazing time in his career, and especially with where the technology of movies went. And, you know, he really wasn't around during the big boom of Netflix produced movies and Amazon produced movies. It would have been fun to see what he would have done with, put, you know, potentially some more experimental roles that studios wouldn't have picked up. In terms of him as an actor and what he actually did perform in, you know, for me, he checks all the boxes that I look at. Earlier in the podcast, you know, Rod Maker mentioned that how well he plays off of other performers, and I couldn't agree more. And it just really shows when he's working with great actors that it's it, his craft is, is, is as good as anybody's. As far as his personal struggles, you know, that ultimately led to his untimely passing, you know, I really have a hard time penalizing that. I, I'm not going to take that in consideration when I'm evaluating his career. I can't relate you know, to the things that he was going through. And, you know, ultimately he couldn't get the help he needed that contributed to him dying earlier than, than he should have. One of the things I am going to do though, is I'm going to give him a slight bump because of what Kyle brought up earlier about Sam Rockwell dedicating his Oscar to, to uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman to this point, including Philip Seymour Hoffman, Sam Rockwell has been my favorite performer we've looked at. So Getting that endorsement from one of the people I've enjoyed studying the most is, is really does mean something to me. So I am going to give him a bump there. With all that being said, I'm going to give Philip Seymour Hoffman an 88, which is just two ticks higher than I gave his good buddy, Sam Rockwell. All right, Warren. Craig, you really hit on a lot of it. Uh, so you're making this pretty easy. The only thing that I, I can really ask for is I wish that he had just a little bit a little bit more additional humor roles. I know he has. I know he's got the the ability to do humor. And even in the movies like Charlie Wilson's War, he doesn't crack a smile the entire movie. And if he does, the mustache is hiding it. But <laughs> he is he delivers everything perfectly. And it is his, you know, character, uh, you know, character you know just complete immerse immersement of himself into these characters and the character acting and you know whatever you want to call it you know it's got a bunch of different names but he he does such an incredible job he brings out the best in all the roles i I think my score would be even higher had he been more of a lead in in later Mm -hmm. movies but he is he brings so much as a as a supporting actor and in his roles that he's basically, he could be credited as a supporting actor, but he, he's basically a lead in everything that he does. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm, I, I do wish I could really see, I could have seen what would have happened. Now, I'm not going to knock him for anything in his personal life because 
people have people battle their own demons and you know it, it's extremely sad you know I, I i watch a bunch of the stuff that he's in and it blows my mind how long ago these movies came out because he like he is he is timeless and if not for his ability to change his physical appearance and make think you know make himself seem perfect for a role like i wouldn't be able to see that big of you know, a jump between this role and this role and this role. He's just awesome in all of it. And mm -hmm. he's by far and away my, my favorite actor that we've covered. And he's going to get my highest score um, by a considerable amount. He's going to get an 89. All right. James. Since he earned his first Academy Award nomination in 2005, the longest he went without being nominated for one was four years. Wow. That is just insane. Like he just year after year knocking out these unbelievable performances. He's, one of 14 actors to have won the Academy Award, BAFTA, Critics' Choice, uh, Golden Globe, and SAG Award, all for the same performance. Wow. He's doing all of this, and what the story about him really is, is what could have been. Like, he is one of the mm -hmm. best actors of my movie-watching life, and mm -hmm. his range is insane, and he can do hysterically funny to the most uh, serious dramatic roles there is, and he died at 46. Like, that is a young, for us to be able to say all that, and he was only 46 years old, I think that is what sucks the most, is that as time passes, his score will only go down as less people kind of get the chance to watch his work. Mm -hmm. Addiction blows, and the amount of people, the amount of awesome people it's taken down is uh, pretty awful. I won't uh, fault him for that, and, you know, Philip Seymour Hoffman's the man. He's forever mortalized in a rap song by Run the Jewels. Uh, he's a tortured Jets and Knicks fan like myself, and I'm sad he's gone. He gets my highest score ever, and I give him a 90. All right. Mike, I'll try not to repeat too much here. You know, there's a lot we can say. Things that haven't been said that I think are worth noting. I think his project choice was really strong. Mm -hmm. Even the couple in there that are either not enjoyable for us or just may maybe didn't hit everybody's going to have those, but most of these, the project choice is, is really stellar. I think you can tell the kind of actor someone is by the people that direct with them and act alongside them. And again, considering that he died at 46, you look at the star-studded cast that have crossed paths with him once or more. It's really incredible. Actors of that caliber do not take on roles with co-stars like Philip Seymour Hoffman who aren't going to bring their weight to the table. And so I think that speaks volumes to the kind of actor he is. I also really respect that he's, you know, he's a true thespian. Uh, I love when you get artists that are so artistic that they manifest themselves in multiple different forms. You saw this, obviously, throughout his career. You saw a lot on the stage. You saw him cross some of that over onto the silver screen. You know, and again, at 46, what, what more could he have done? I don't hold a lot of the the personal stuff against him when I look at someone like this. It's you know, it's what kind of an actor was was he? He knocked it out of the park. The only other thing that I'm thinking of here uh, is you know he doesn't step into the spotlight a ton, but as we've discussed, I don't think you need to do that necessarily. Also, to be a great actor, maybe to get you know the higher score or, or to really to really catch the the eyes of of some folks that may be necessary. But I think you can be an, a great character actor uh, as uh, he was and still make a, a huge mark uh, on Hollywood. You know, things to, to hate and dislike. He died at 46. Uh, it's so, so young. Uh, and you think of mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, people we know or, or those of us uh, who are, are closer to that age. It's just, it's so short. Mm -hmm. Really tragic. Uh, I don't have the experience here, but Philip Seymour Hoffman really kind of strikes the, uh, checks all the boxes that I'm looking for in an actor. Uh, and, you know, so at the risk of maybe uh, tipping the scale one way or the other, I'm going to give him a 91. All right. On my end, I, I'm going to only mention a couple things. So while he does play a supporting role, I mean, he's always memorable. He's always top notch and brings his A game. And so no matter if he's a leading man or not, he does what he does. And he did it very well. No one we covered has has as much range as he does. I need to say that even Bramma Thompson, who I think is the most well-rounded performer that we've covered up to this point, in my opinion. But in terms of just like selecting a top 10 movie roles for him, it's just a nightmare. Like no matter the list Rigby would have picked, it would have been a nightmare to just narrow it down to 10. You saw we went through probably 15 
like wrong answers where we're like, oh, that had a legitimate chance of being in the top 10. I think it goes to show how many home runs he's hit. For the most part, though, he takes a little bit of a hit for me for longevity, personal life, and comedy. But overall, he's uh, about as good as it gets. So he's getting a 90 from me. Rigby, round us out. Yeah, you guys hit on all of them. You know, when we first, when Kyle asked me what, last year, I guess, if I wanted to be a part of this podcast, actors like Philip Seymour Hoffman, I think, what are what got me excited most about talking about actors for a podcast like this because it's people talking about their favorite roles and movies that they really like and and performances that they'll always remember and philip seymour hoffman is like the one of the five people that come to mind for me for like who would be the perfect guy to cover on this you guys all covered the basics that i was going to touch on so with that being said he's going to get my highest score he's going to get a 93 warren i already know it's going to be highest but what's that average that gives Philip Seymour Hoffman, our highest scorer by a considerable margin of a 90.17, which puts him almost five above Emma Thompson for first place. Damn. Yeah, she was, uh, she was wow. what, 86? Yeah, like 86.6, and he's at a 90.17, which is four and a half. Pretty, pretty fair score. <laughs> our range was an 89 to a 93, which is probably the narrowest range that we've ever had. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Somebody. I would care to guess that he is about twice as good as Gabriel Byrne. <laughs> I was gonna, <laughs> according, to, according to my score, he's about twice as good as Gabriel Byrne. Warren, I was going to dock him some points because he wasn't in enough movies with Gabriel Byrne. But <laughs> yeah. he was in one play with him, you know, yep. pass there. I found an actress that he worked with more than three times. I'll give you the hint. What actress appeared in The Big Lebowski, Boogie Nights? Julianne Moore. Magnolia? Yeah, Julianne Moore. So we would normally talk about what they have coming soon, but, you know. No, we can. Um, His son, Cooper Hoffman, is in an upcoming American drama film directed and written by Paul Thomas Anderson and follows a high school student becoming an actor in the 1970s. I love it. Cooper Hoffman, Bradley Cooper, um, and Benny Safdie, one of the Safdie brothers. Mm -hmm. So we're getting the uncut gem cinematic universe. (laughs) That's what we like to see. So five actors we're putting on the wheel for the next episode, so episode 34. Those five actors are Chris Rock, Parker Posey, James Caan, Alicia Silverstone, and Dan Aykroyd. What do we love? What do we hate? And anywhere in between. I want to see James Caan. Any one of the guys, they're just in a bunch of really... I wouldn't mind seeing like Chris Rock. I can't think of what Alicia Silverstone's been in besides Clueless. Batman. Okay. I would say Chris Rock, too. <laughs> Chris Rock would be fun because somebody will get to watch uh, like some of the... Adam Sandler shitty movies again. B movie. It's got a lot of good good stand up too. Dan Eckerwood, I don't know if it would be a good episode, but it'd Bro, be entertaining. The to... correct answer is James Conn. <laughs> yeah. Misery, Godfather. Brian Song. Yeah. Just... That's that's my boy with Adam Sandler. <laughs> <laughs> Elf. <laughs> this is a stud. I'm looking at Parker Posey's top four, and it's Scream Three, The Eye. Superman Returns and Blade Trinity, which I wouldn't mind watching Blade Trinity again. Ryan Reynolds uh, is kind you, of funny. Trust me, you don't, you, don't, you don't need to. <laughs> You'd get dazed and confused. What about you, Mike? What would you pick? God, man. The comedian in me wants to go Dan Aykroyd, but I probably got to go James Caan. Huh? That a boy. That's the right answer. Yeah. That's what I like to <laughs> I really like Aykroyd, though. Saturday Night Live and everything he's done. Oof. Mm-hmm. Rod, well, do you just do you just want to be the fifth, the sixth Munson? Sorry, you just come back and pick every single time, and I'm I'm all for it. <laughs> back and yeah, you just need a little support. That's all. <laughs> That's all he needs. <laughs> Luckily, there's only one Gabriel Byrne, so when that's out of the way now, and we could just move on in life. So that's that's good. You said that about there's only one Chris O'Dowd. Now there's one <laughs> Gabriel Byrne, and so now there's yeah. there's only one Margot Martindale, right? Oh, God, God, I want to cover her so much. She's good. She'd be fun. <laughs> she would, um, be, would fun. be a lot. Le- there'd be a lot leading up to that, and just in terms of the fun element. But um, hey, we don't choose. The wheel decides, and we'll see how it falls. <laughs> Mike, always a pleasure to have you back, my friend. Any plugs that you want to drop for our audience about what you're working on? And I know last time I think you talked a little bit about your photography. Nothing too terrible right now. I mean, get vaccinated, pay attention, get out there. Mm. Let's open the world up again, keep everybody safe. Yeah, that would be the plug I'd make right now. Support that. Hell yeah. 
we can get with that. It was great having you back on the pod, buddy. I yeah, really appreciate Mike. you all. Fun it time. Was a pleasure. This is always a lot of fun. And yeah, definitely. Anytime you all need somebody, hit me up. It's always a great couple hours for me. All right, man. Well, our next episode is going to drop on April 22nd. Our guest is Aubrey McKay of Movie Babble. He's a fan of the podcast. He's a film teacher, film nut, and is pretty pumped to, to join us. So be excited to have Aubrey with us next time. As always, you can find us on Twitter, Munson's at Movies. You can find us on Instagram, Munson's at the Movies. You can email us, Munson's at the Movies at gmail.com. Any final thoughts from the Munson's? Shut up! Shut the fuck up! Oh, shut up! Shut up! Shut, 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 shut up! Shut up! Munson's out. All right, let's go. Thank you for the education, gentlemen. We've just received a PhD in stupidity. Doctor, shall we?